on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Transmissible spongiform encephalop. Your brain literally ends up looking like a sponge. People ask me all the time, like, do you eat the brains of this? Do you eat the brains of that? And I always go like, look, I just don't mess with eating brains. If you have CWD in an area and hunters stop hunting, you'd have a lot of sick, skinny, drooling deer tipping over on people's lawns. I try to take a pretty broad approach to the game that we eat because is venison gonna be a viable food source in the future? Studies have been done with CWD showing that pastures can remain contaminated 16 years later. This disease is going to have far ranging impacts, you know, long after we're gone. Think about your grandkids hunting. People listening to this show, a lot of them are going to be like, I'm going to keep these bones to make bone stock. I'm going to use these brains to brain tan a hide. What are those best practices? I constantly implore the hunters. It might be a small proportion of the population, but you're mighty when it comes to these things. Episode 60 of the Wild Fed Podcast, What You Need to Know About Chronic Wasting Disease with Kristen Schuler is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's flagship product, Pine Pollen Pure Potency, is back in stock. That one's hard to keep on the shelves because so many people are using it. I formulated Pure Potency a decade ago after learning about the declining testosterone levels in men due to the conditions of modern living and the way testosterone naturally decreases over time as a man ages. It's what we call andropause. Pure Potency is an extract of pine pollen because of its naturally occurring testosterone, androstenedione, and DHEA with an extract of stinging nettle root for its ability to free your body's own naturally occurring testosterone, which is sometimes present but not freely circulating in your bloodstream. Made with real vanilla bean, orange peel, and a touch of real maple syrup, Pure Potency is delicious too. Find it and more at SirThrival.com. WildFed is also brought to you by Farmer's Juice. Farmer's Juice Home delivers cold-pressed juices and wellness shots direct to your door at nearly half the cost of what you'd pay at the juice bar, and they stay fresh for 30 days with nothing artificial added. These juices are awesome, from their fresh orange juice to their nutritive green juices and their anti-inflammatory wellness shots with ginger and turmeric. They've even got low sugar and ketogenic options available in both juices and in shots. In fact, they've got juices to help you meet all of your health goals. Each of their juices is a full pound of fresh organic produce with no artificial ingredients, just 100% plants. Look, I've got a juicer at home, but I'm just too busy to use it and buying enough organic produce to run through it costs a fortune. I'd rather let the folks at Farmer's Juice handle it for me. They believe in healthy soil, healthy plants, and healthy humans. That's why they use organic ingredients sourced from local California farms. Head over to thefarmersjuice.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for up to $8 off your order and get these refreshing juices delivered right to your door. They come in an insulated box packed with cold packs, and I challenge you to get them all out of the box before you start drinking one. I haven't yet. Again, go to thefarmersjuice.com and use the coupon code WILDFED. I love these juices, and I think you will too. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's episode is an important one. We're talking with Dr. Kristen Schuler about chronic wasting disease, or CWD. If you hunt any member of the deer family, have friends or family that do, or even just like to salvage roadkills, if you're eating venison, you need to know about CWD. Maybe you're like me and you live in a place where CWD hasn't showed up yet. If so, then now's the time to get educated, not when it's on your doorstep, because it's spreading. And as it does, it's changing our relationship to deer, elk, moose, and caribou hunting. And I think it's fair to say it's altering the landscape too, leaving behind its nearly indestructible infectious agent to begin the infection cycle again. In fact, the story of this disease is like something out of science fiction, and when you hear it for the first time, it's almost hard to believe what you're hearing could be true. But it is, and there are very real and important things we can do as hunters and consumers of venison to prevent the spread of this 100% fatal deer disease. 
Today, Dr. Kristen Schuler is going to explain what we know about CWD, how and where it's spreading, how we can slow it down, get our meat tested, and be sure we don't inadvertently create hotspots where we live by introducing it into or onto our landscape. It seems to me that CWD is one of the great wildlife challenges of our time. And while we hunters like to pride ourselves on being good conservationists, CWD gives us our opportunity to prove it. It's not just federal and state agencies that'll have to answer the call. It's us, those of us who hunt and eat venison. We're the ones that can either help get this under control or, if we aren't careful, massively exacerbate its spread. I think it has the potential to end deer hunting as we think of it today, or at least fundamentally alter it. And as someone who'll be cooking venison for dinner tonight, I do not want to see that happen. So if you're new to learning about CWD, pay close attention because this affects you, or at least it eventually will. And if you're already familiar, I bet you'll hear something new today in this conversation that you haven't heard before. I certainly did while recording this interview, and now I feel far better prepared for what's on the horizon. Dr. Kristen Schuler, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, tell us a little bit. (laughs) I'm happy to have you here and actually uh, quite a few things I'm interested in talking to you about today. Um, Tell us a little bit about your uh, education, your background and the work you've done uh, in zoonotic disease. Sure. So I am a wildlife disease ecologist. I went to school basically studying wildlife. So I did a, a master's and a PhD And during those educational opportunities, I really got interested in wildlife health. And so that drove my PhD research quite a bit, where I investigated chronic wasting disease ecology at Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. So I I caught deer with helicopters. I followed them around. When they died, we did necropsies, which is the equivalent of a human autopsy. And... After that, I went and worked at the U.S. Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center, which is the equivalent of the CDC for wildlife health. And then uh, for personal reasons, I needed to move to New York, and I was lucky enough to get a position at Cornell University at their diagnostic lab, and we started the New York State Wildlife Health Program. And so now I'm co-director of the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab which is part of that statewide uh, program. Can I, I want to ask a little bit about uh, how you decided to go down this career path, but first, what does it mean you catch a uh, deer by helicopter? Uh, so yeah, that, that was the fun stuff. I mostly do email <laughs> now, but uh, we would, we, we needed to test deer for chronic wasting disease and other diseases. And so we had a helicopter that that's their job. They, they go around the country and, and do wildlife captures. And so in this situation, like a rocket you know, net or something, uh, sort of, uh, so they actually have a shotgun that has been specially adapted that it shoots a net over the deer. So they get down wow. really, really low, shoot the wow. net over the deer and it, it, it tangles it up enough that it stops it. And then a guy in the helicopter called a mugger jumps out and hobbles it and blindfolds it. And they would put it uh, on a long line beneath the helicopter and then fly it back to me to do the testing. And wow. we would monitor its vitals and everything, put the collar on it and then release it. And they would bounce away. And it only took probably a few minutes for the whole process. Wow. The mugger. Yeah, that's not a legal method of take here in Maine, unfortunately, but it sounds like a No, no, it's <laughs> not. Like but, a lot of fun. But, yeah, for all the moose studies and everything that they're doing in Maine, yeah, you know, it's right. it's the same type of companies that are, are doing that. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. What, what led you down the path of uh, working in wildlife? And I know you, um, or at least I believe you have a background as a hunter. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so I, you know, like a lot of people, I, I liked animals and I wanted to work with animals. And so I investigated the veterinary route, but that wasn't something I was that interested in working in a clinic. You know, I wanted to be outside. I really liked wild animals. So I, I just found ways. It it wasn't necessarily a clear career path, but, um, you know, I grew up in Northwest Pennsylvania. So I spent a lot of time outside. Um, my father was a hunter and I have horses and would ride. And it just um, was something I, I kept 
working towards and sort of got lucked into these things because I didn't even know that you could go to grad school for wildlife. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> right. So, but um, yeah, hunting, I, I didn't start out as a hunter. You know, my dad was, and we, I grew up eating, you know, wild game all the time, but it just wasn't something I was interested in because I was worried about, um, you know, just the, the ability to take a clean shot, to make a good kill, you know, to co not cause any pain and suffering. So one thing that sort of helped out was when I was doing that research in South Dakota, we used a helicopter, but then I also would uh, trap deer and I would dart them. And so I got really good with a, a dart rifle. And that was kind <laughs> yeah. of like the, right. you know, the catch and release type of hunting that I would feel <laughs> yeah, pretty good stakes. about. Yeah, lower stakes. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, it's like a, is so, it like a bolt action rifle? It's pneumatic or something? Uh, yeah, it's, it's air powered. It's CO2. Yeah. And okay. so I would go to the range and I would practice. I was really good up <laughs> to about 40 yards. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, you know, I, in South Dakota, you have to pheasant hunt, obviously that's the thing to do out there. And, um, you know, I'm, I enjoy venison. I enjoy game meat. So, uh, other types of hunting sort of opportunities came along and people would take me along and mentor me that way. And now we have property and, and primarily eat venison in my family. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm the same way. And, and I guess that was part of what led me to want to talk to you today. I, I try to take a pretty broad approach to the game that we eat. And part of the reason is because, you know, taking the, I guess, just a, a really stepped back big picture view of the landscape around servants in the United States today, I've just been asking myself, is venison going to be a viable food source in the future, um, based on the sort of trends that I'm seeing. And so I, because I really love eating venison, but I like eating be uh, bears and I like eating ducks and I like eating, you know, uh, grouse and all, all these other species that are here. And I try to be really broad because again, it seems like CWD is encroaching, um, closer and closer all the time. And, and, uh, it was just, I think last year that we had a case up in, uh, Quebec that felt just so close to home to us in Maine really kind of gave us all a bit of a scare. So I would love to start talking about CWD and wondering if you could brief us uh, as if, you know, we just stepped into the room and never heard of it. Uh, could you give us like a big, big picture overview? And then maybe we can kind of uh, get into some finer resolution after. Absolutely. So CWD stands for chronic wasting disease, and that's in the family of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs. Uh, transmissible, because it can go from animal to animal. Spongiform, because your brain literally ends up looking like a sponge. That's what the disease does, is it kills the brain cells. And then encephalopathy, because it's a disease of the brain. And other diseases that are similar to CWD, include bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is also known as mad cow disease, and scrapie in sheep. These diseases are all caused by an abnormal prion, which is a misfolded protein. So this is different than a bacteria or a virus. Um, it's a totally different class of disease agent. And it's been known for a while, there's, there's different varieties of human TSEs as well that might be caused by genetics. They might occur spontaneously. But in the case of CWD, this They've is- They've been concentrated uh, through cannibalism in some places too, haven't they? Yeah, that was actually how um, they discovered the whole thing. There was, uh, it was called Kuru in Papua New Guinea, where people had cannibalistic behaviors and they literally would eat their relatives' brains as a source of protein and figured out eventually that it wasn't a genetic disease, that it was, you know, being passed through this practice. Okay. And they so that's that, where we actually kind of, that's where we figured out what prions are in the first place. Yeah. It, well, it's still, unfortunately it's still being challenged. So that was the first sort of identification of a, a prion disease. There were some other ones that had been kind of linked um, to gen genetics because they would be passed in families, but that was, um, it was Stanley Prusinger who identified this proteinaceous particle that he termed a prion and he won the Nobel prize for it. And oh, wow. okay. yeah, so it's, it's just been tough because 
people want to think that it's something else. It's been called a slow virus. Other people think that it's caused by this other bacteria called the spiroplasm, but consistently it's been shown over and over that these abnormally fo folded proteins and the reason that they cause damage is because their shape doesn't allow them to be bound by proteases. So proteases are the molecules that break down proteins. And because they so can't break those down- would be, Those are enzymatic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that enzyme would normally break it down so your body could then, what, down into amino acids and then your body could either redistribute or clear those or something? Exactly. Okay. So it's like the body's cleaning process can't happen and they start building up these plaques on the brain cells and essentially poison the cell. They smother it and the cell oh, wow. ends up bursting and dying. And that's why you end up with holes in the brain. Okay. And now I, I've, I've sort of interrupted you from the briefing, so I want to sure. get back and then I'm going to want to go back into this stuff because I have so many questions that are emerging. But I know. But it's, there's a lot the of them. Fascinating. Okay. So... Yeah, these TSEs um, and chronic wasting disease is one of them. Uh, functions sim more similar to scrapie in sheep, which is a disease that's been around for about 200 years. And uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow is the reason that we, we worry a lot about human transmission of CWD, uh, that it could, you know, from eating infected animals that you could get CWD because of BSE, but in scrapie, they haven't seen that. And people have been eating infected sheep for a long time. So we kind of have evidence on both sides um, of the equation where it might be a threat to humans, where it might not. Are, are people today um, still eating sheep with scrapie? Is there, how, how is that regulated and or uh, filtered? So the USDA had a big eradication program for scrapie, and they really did a pretty good job of getting rid of a lot of the flocks that were infected. They also had a pretty intensive breeding program where they were trying to breed resistant sheep. The problem with that was that uh, then the sheep started getting this uh, abnormal form of scrapie. They call it atypical scrapie. So they still get a TSE, but it doesn't look like the one that they were used to. And that sort of, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily give us a lot of hope for the genetic resistance of deer with chronic wasting disease. Okay. That was another question I was going to ask you. Um, so are, is, is scrapie also in wild populations or is it only in domestic flocks? Only in domestics. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, all right. So I've interrupted you again. <laughs> you that's that's all that, right. Uh, piece so, by piece. so yeah, it's, um, CWD was first identified in a research facility in Colorado in 1967. And then in the 70s and 80s, they fi started finding cases in the wild with uh, mule deer and elk and white-tailed deer. And so for a number of decades, it just sort of persisted in low numbers in that sort of Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, it started creeping into South Dakota a little bit. And then after 2002, when it was discovered in Wisconsin, that was sort of the biggest jump eastward that we saw. And then we started seeing it cropping up in more and more states. And a lot of states hadn't really been testing that much before it. But, you know, there are a lot of states that have been testing since 2002 and haven't discovered it. So it, it really seems like it's the movement of animals their carcasses and their parts or products that are spreading this disease across the country. You know, one deer isn't going to move that far to spread it everywhere. So we've really identified that people are moving things around quite a bit. And because of those practices, they can introduce disease to new areas. So that's why there's a lot of new regulations about movements of carcasses and parts. A lot of states aren't allowing people to bring in uh, carcasses hunter harvested carcasses from other states uh, because they're trying to limit that movement of this potentially infectious material. So in the carcass, the prions tend to exist in the highest concentrations in the brain and the spinal cord. And then there's a few other organs like the eyes and the spleen where you might see them more often. There are prions in the muscle tissue, but they're usually in, in lower concentration. And by, you know, deboning a carcass, 
and just bringing back the venison, you're really leaving the majority of the infectious material, you know, wherever you shot that deer. So there's just in a addition, whole host of things in a, there. Yeah. In, a, in addition to hunters, how, el- what are the other ways, uh, like hunters as a vector seems really obvious. What are some ways that people might not be thinking of who are hearing this right now that, um, human beings are also facilitating the movement of this disease around the country? Well, there are probably two p- potential ones. We, one we know is in the captive cervid industry. So there are people who own uh, deer and elk and they keep them behind high fences. They may raise them for you know ha- hunting preserves or breeding stock or urine production. And so movement of those animals to other areas is one way that we've seen CWD move as well. So we track, um, in the the buying and selling of those animals. Yeah. So they'll, there's no, uh, live test that's performed before these animals are moved. They're Mm -hmm. only tested after they're dead in certain situations. So that makes it hard to know if you're buying an animal that's not infected, you're kind of going on that herd's history of testing and, Okay. Um, it's, it's not an ideal system to, to do that. There are some places in Texas now that are trying to do more live testing. It's, it, that's been approved, I think in the state as a, as a test that they can use before moving animals. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the captive industry has, um, been struggling this, with this right along, you know, with wild cervids as well. And then I mentioned urine, uh, sort of these deer attractants. So prions can be shed in the saliva, feces, and urine of infected deer well before they ever appear sick. And so by potentially putting that urine on the ground, and we know now that prions actually bind to s- certain soil types, they're ionically charged. So they like soils like clay and bind to those relatively uh, tightly and remain infectious. So they're going to be like a positively charged protein to a negatively charged. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's like an adsorption that's happening. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So that's really the fact fascinating. That- so, so clays then or anything like that, that's going to have that negative electrical charge. Do mm-hmm. they, once they've bound to that, I'm just thinking about it because a lot of times clays will be used to bind things to remove them. Um, and so I often think about, uh, you know, electrically charged soil types being used to detoxify something. Um, but in this case, those prions are attached to that then electrically. Are they still fairly infectious at that point? They are, unfortunately. So studies have been done with CWD showing that pastures can remain contaminated for more than two years. So if you just leave a carcass laying in a pasture, it's contaminated. You put new animals in and they get infected. They've done studies. From the soil. um, Yeah. From sheep brains where they actually buried brain material in the soil, dug the soil up 16 years later and injected it uh, into animals and they became diseased as well. Wow. Did you say 16 years? I know it's, it's, we don't actually know what the upper limit of how long these things can last. Okay. They're just okay. really, really hardy. One of the, yeah, that's one of the things I've always read about them is that <clears throat> they're very resistant to, to the kind of things we would normally do. Uh, you know, you'd, I'd think UV and exposure to the elements. I'd think, uh, the cooking temperatures, heat, you know, things like that. Oxidation. Um, can you just sort of describe to people how resistant um, prions are and uh, how, you know, what, what it takes to actually break them down? Or de- I guess it would be denature them since they're a protein. Mm-hmm. Yep. They, they are denatured. So unfortunately, cooking temperatures don't get it, the job done. They're just too low. It's really, we're talking about uh, like 1800 degrees Celsius, which you know, <laughs> a little hotter anything. than we cook at. Yeah. My yeah. oven does yeah. not go up to that. No, it does not. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and really harsh chemicals like bleach solutions um, okay. are, are what's needed to denature those proteins. So it's really a, a super pathogen, you know, in terms of persisting, it can bind to the soil, it can be taken up into plant tissues. Um, it remains infectious in the plant tissues. So you could, um, continue to spread prions that way it also wait a second so can you 
let's back that up because that's just crazy. <laughs> so taken up the, the, the misfolded protein, which is not mm-hmm. its, its own living entity and doesn't have any genetic material, right? It's just a, it's a conglomerate of amino acids, right? But it's misfolded. It can be drawn up in its whole form into the plant and then be in the tissues of the plant? Correct. And then that plant could be consumed by another animal. And is it infectious? It remains infectious. So that's not good. The concentration the, must be so small, right? Yeah, exactly. It Likely. Um, okay. the, these studies are, have only been done in you know laboratory settings. It's really okay. difficult to figure out where you can do this in, nat- in nature. I mean, we know that right. there's prions in Wisconsin around mineral licks. Uh, there's research uh-huh. done on that. But in these uh, plant experiments, these were done in laboratories by um, uh, Claudia Soto, a researcher in Texas, where they looked at things like corn and alfalfa, tomatoes, uh, wheat. So Okay. So places where deer could conceivably be and where soil mm-hmm. could be contaminated. Okay. So that means also that, that human beings could be coming into contact with those prions without even consuming contaminated meat then, potentially. Right. Which is why we talk about, you know, it's not just a thing that hunters should be concerned about. This is a disease that the public should really have on their radar. I saw, did you give testimony to the Congress on this topic? I did. That was um, last summer. In okay. June. I I think that uh, most Americans have had such a crash course on the Congress in the last couple of years, like kind of, <laughs> kind of a sense of what what goes on and then maybe like oh, how, what doesn't go on there. I guess I, I'm just curious what kind of interest and or response you got from the Congress and what was it to a specific delegation or something like how, how did that work? And then, or a task force or something. And then, uh, yeah, how did they respond and what was their interest level in the topic? So this was a hearing by the house committee on natural resources, the oversight subcommittee. And so they already have some passing interest in this kind of a topic then. Yeah, yeah. So the, they're definitely interested in it. And this was my first time to Congress. So I can't pass myself on, off as an expert on what should happen or, or happen behind the scenes. But I was really impressed with the the level of knowledge of the staffers putting together the hearing. They were they okay. were really into it. One of the staffers even had a pre on tie. Um, so, <laughs> what does that you know, mean? That, <laughs> that shows you right there that he was engaged. Um, okay. Like pictures of prions on his tie? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know where he <laughs> got it. I had never seen one before. Right. Okay. Uh, Interesting. So I I can't say exactly what that hearing did. It was myself. It was the director of Texas Parks and Wildlife. There was Nick Benzinato from the National Deer Alliance, now the National Deer Association, and Jason Sumners, who is a wildlife biologist from Missouri. And, you know, we all gave our different perspectives. I, I gave from the, the point of view of, you know, what's the scientific information on this disease. And the, the thing I can say that came out this year that may or may not have been linked was that uh, USDA did have about $12 million in funding for CWD research that states applied for and you know are are currently in the process of receiving that I think they'll receive next fiscal year, and there hadn't been any funding available, federal funding available since um, 2012. So this is a okay. burden. You know, CWD has really been a burden that the state agencies, the state wildlife agencies, have had to bear as far as you know paying for the cost of testing, all the surveillance that they're doing. You know, there's a lot of logistics and personnel costs with that. And then management activities as well. Okay, there's a whole bunch there to unpack, and and I guess I want to start off by saying I think um, I, I think I'm safe to say this: there has currently not been any known transmission of CWD to a human being. That's correct, right? Correct. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. But we also know that the the sort of incubation time of a prion for uh, a human um, spongiform encephalitis can be long, right? So like how long of a period of time does somebody sit with something like, um, you know, is it Cruxfield Jacobson? Is that how you say it? Close. Cruxfield Jacob. 
Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, <laughs> how long did how long does somebody sit with that before um, they start to become symptomatic and and you know the pathology is sort of revealed? So going back to uh, mad cow disease, we saw Creutzfeldt Jakob disease in people. The typical presentation would be like, you know, 65-ish was the average age. And, you know, that's sort of the time when people might ha be having cognitive decline anyway. But when Mad Cow hit the UK and Europe, they started seeing young people like mid-20s that were having these major cognitive declines. They couldn't, you know, they'd have rapid eye movement. They couldn't walk or talk right. And so that really clued people in that something abnormal was happening. So with these prion diseases, at least in CWD and deer, it's usually a year or two before they show any clinical signs. So it doesn't happen okay. quickly. And what, what happens is the, the abnormal prion actually hijacks your own body's uh, normal prions. So we have prions in our body, you know, they're broken down by those proteases that we talked about earlier. We're not entirely sure what their function is. But, I was just going to ask: you know, Are they functional, and or are they uh, are they um, damaged in some way? We don't know. No, that. they're just they're just fine. You know, they're just kind of okay. in your body, um, and you know they do whatever it is they do, and then they get broken down. But when the abnormal form goes in, it it's kind of like almost like a crystal formation where the abnormal form causes the normal prions to misfold and it change its shape where it can no longer be broken down. And Through we're contact? still not entirely. Um, I don't, that's not my area of expertise and okay. I don't think but it that catalyzes really a change. In, so, so a, yes. a, the body's normal prion is present. There's the misfolded prion is, has been, is in the body through, consuming it, right? Either through mm -hmm. food yes. and or from a lick or from saliva or something like that. So you get it in there and then the two come in contact with each other in some way and it catalyzes a change in the body's natural prion and that then becomes Correct. one of these misfolded prions. Man, it's mm -hmm. kind of terrifying to even think about. Do you have nightmares about this? Uh, not anymore. No, <laughs> you know, you kind of just, it, it, it sounds ridiculous almost when you put it all together. Like here's yeah, this thing that you can't kill that like... hijacks your body. You know, right. It, Killing it and, is like when you were saying earlier, the temperatures and the chemicals and all those things, like the inconvenient part is those things kill everything. Right. So it's, right. A, if you want to get rid of it, it's like a scorched earth thing you have to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's a problematic. Like, <laughs> The best thing we have, the best tool that we have is to kill the host, you know, to stop right. the disease. And that's not very convenient. So right. even autoclaving doesn't get rid of prions. Right. Yeah. I've been uh, actually was uh, talking to somebody recently about the how surgical tools had been contaminated mm -hmm. uh, in some instances. Okay. So you were a moment ago, you were talking about um, Crooksfield Jakob, and I kind of got us going on another tangent here. Um, quick question about that. Was that, what was the case fatality rate for that? Uh, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So if you and get it, you're going CWD. to die from it. Right. right. And same with CWD, correct? Like no deer is no deer survive that infection. Exactly. Is, are any deer so, resistant to that infection? So resistant is kind of a loaded term. There's, uh, Animals that have a genetic makeup that looks like it's a very small, like 1% of the population that might live with the disease for a little bit longer, but ultimately they're going to die. So wow. the theory is that maybe, you know, they could increase their proportion in the population so that, you know, they can have one more generation before they croak. But so far, no deer, no, nothing has been 100% resistant to it or it won't get it must be congenitally passed though can they have offspring that are free of it or, or are the offspring always going to be infected no so far it doesn't appear to be we so we call that vertical transmission when it goes from mother okay. to offspring it looks like it's more from horizontal transmission really? so animal we to found animal. the weakness <laughs> that's yeah. the weakness how do we exploit that <laughs> um, okay so um b back to before though so you were talking about um mad cow in humans and um mm -hmm. sort of how long that was in people before it would manifest right so so that um 
you know, it's still going to be a number of months. I want to say 18, but I'm not entirely sure that's correct. The thing about, it's called variant creutzfeldt jakob disease when it originated from mad cow, is that there were very few people that actually developed that, just over 200 globally. Um, so it it hasn't, it seems like there might be a pretty good species barrier between, okay. you know, these these animal TSEs and human exposure to them. But, you know, there's still a lot of people out there that if you spend any time in, you know, UK or, or Europe during that time, you're not allowed to donate blood. And so wow, yeah. a lot of people were exposed during that outbreak. Okay. And they killed millions and millions of cows to stop it. And then here with CWD, we it is restricted just to North America at present? Uh, no, actually, it's been found oh, no. <laughs> in Korea. Oh, uh, no. There were there were elk that were exported from Canada that went to Korea. And they just since 2016, there were reindeer in Norway that were found to have CWD. And since then, oh, they started looking no. and found some moose with a different, what looks like a different type of CWD in Sweden and Finland and Norway. Okay. And then also, I guess, uh, just backing up even a little bit further for folks. So it's cervids who are susceptible to this. So that's going to be all the species of deer, which includes elk, which includes moose, which includes caribou and reindeer, right? So um, right. am I leaving anybody out? Um, and, and do we find it in all of those species? Uh, yeah. So white-tailed deer, mule deer, black-tailed deer, um, elk, red deer, moose, caribou, reindeer. There are some other um, species of sort of Asian deer, like axis deer and sika deer. There's muntjac deer that are little tiny things that are used in research. There, um, there are some that appear to be um, less susceptible that we haven't seen yet. Like for a long time, we didn't think reindeer were necessarily susceptible. There had been some experimental transmission, but nobody was sure if reindeer were actually going to get it. And then obviously when it showed up in Norway, uh, in the wild reindeer herd, that proved that yes, they could indeed get it. So there haven't wow. been as many experimental trials on different species as we might like. Um, so yeah. I think we've still got a lot to learn that on exactly which species are susceptible. Okay, but here in the US, where are we, what animals are we seeing it in the most? Uh, that would be white-tailed deer, mule deer, and elk. Occasionally okay. moose, um, but moose seem to be relatively small numbers. Okay. Is it because they're more solitary, do you think? I think so. I think they're not overlapping in habitat as much. Yeah. Um, we actually surveyed all the fish and wildlife agencies that had detected CWD in moose and, and tried to figure out, you know, how much surveillance are they doing in moose and, you know. There were, there were about a dozen cases in moose in North America. Oh, okay. And then because, uh, I guess I want to wrap this back around to your testimony of the Congress and, and the idea of federal monies, because obviously this isn't restricted to any one state and um, there's transportation over state lines and it seems like uh, where so much wildlife is regulated at the state level first, um, but this seems to be sort of a federal issue. So how is that? part working politically as far as um, states managing it and then the federal government um, becoming involved in it? Uh, what are the sort of politics right now? And then, and and I guess also, are, are there political breakdowns and there must be just huge disagreements about this at some levels? So what's the political landscape like and, and how does this sort of, who's really in charge, the states or the Fed? <laughs> I, I wish I had a good answer for that, but I don't. And- <laughs> Unfortunately, it has become a very political disease. So the captive cervid industry is overseen by a USDA program called the Herd Certification Program. So states can adopt that program and that allows herds to move interstate so they can move their animals from one state to another. And the owners of those herds can decide to participate or not and then the states can decide, you know, if they're adopting those standards or if they're developing their own. So there's a lot of confusion, even state to state, about language and, you know, how good the surveillance is, how they're looking at things. But on the then there's the wild side of things where 
deer are a game animal. And so they're regulated by state wildlife agencies primarily. On the, the federal side, you do have a lot of federal lands that are owned by the Department of the Interior. Um, you have some forest service land. So it, it gets complicated um, and who has jurisdiction? There's, uh, you know, if, if you get a positive detection in a state from a diagnostic lab, they have to send that to a USDA laboratory because it's a, a reportable disease. So for wildlife, it, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I got that part. Did you say, did you say if it's detected at a state level that has to be sent up to the federal level? Yes. So it's, okay. it's usually because it's a reportable by, disease. Okay. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, so it, it gets really challenging, um, you know, for these states because they have to fund a lot of their own work and there's not um, sort of the federal support that had been there at the beginning of CWD. You know, for a lot of these okay. wildlife diseases in general, like, you know, whether it's CWD or West Nile virus or avian influenza, a lot of times when it first comes out, there'll be federal money available. And that usually lasts for a few years and then people seem to forget about it. And then there's no federal money available for it, even though the disease is still a problem. Uh, this and is it, what you were talking about before, that there was some CWD money and then it sort of dried exactly. up. And now, there's, now there's another 12 mm -hmm. million. Right. Wow. Because it just seems like it could really ultimately impact so many people. And then I'm also thinking about the impact of, I think something maybe the general non-hunting public just doesn't think a lot about the money from hunting, the money that hunting generates for wildlife research across the country. So what impact is CWD having on, is it having any impact on hunter numbers, confidence in hunt, you know, for deer hunters? And are they starting to, is it starting to impact hunter numbers? And is that having any impact yet at the fiscal level? Or, or are there projections about that? Because that seems like it could have a lot of downstream trickle down effects. Absolutely. So um, let me start with the the hunting response to it, and then we can talk about some of the financial stuff. Uh, there have been a lot of human dimension studies done, you know, how will hunters react when um, CWD is found in their area? Will they stop hunting? Will they stop traveling to hunt? And it does seem like it impacts um, certain hunters. So Wisconsin did a lot of studies looking at, you know, in-state hunters versus out-of-state hunters. And CWD sort of translated to like a, a general 10% decline in hunting if it's detected, you know, in a particular area that people would stop hunting. So if we translate that into, you know, the revenue brought in from hunting, and, and this is actually something uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but I engaged with economists to try to get uh, numbers that we could give to decision makers, to the politicians, to help them understand how important hunting was and how much of an economic driver it was, especially in rural areas. So for New York, we did the analysis and figured out that uh, one year of hunting was worth about one and a half billion dollars to the state. And that's from license sales, from uh, retail sales and taxes. So that's not even including the money generated from, you know, the value of the actual venison from the food stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it depends on what, you know, what kind of price you want to pay, put on, you know, a pound of venison. If it, you're saying it's worth, you know, $6, you could be up to $77 million just from the value of venison alone. Plus wow. the value of the recreation. There's been right. work done out of the Cornell Center for Conservation Social Science, where they figured out that a day of hunting is worth about forty dollars to people. So if you figure oh, out, you know, the okay. the number of hunters and you know, average number of days of field and everything, it it's a lot of money. So then applying that sort of ten percent decline to that, you're talking about one hundred and fifty million dollars just in one state. So that, that really got people's attention um, about how big of an issue this is because there weren't a lot of um, organizations sort of out there that were necessarily concerned about CWD until the last few years. And then we've really seen um, sort of a coalescence of interest from hunting organizations talking about CWD. It was, you know, 
it was one of those things that might have been easy to ignore until it it sort of grew to a critical mass. But um, they're they're a lot of the ones taking this information forward and really trying to push the politicians on it because there aren't, you know, scientists like me don't necessarily feel comfortable lobbying people and and agencies can't. So you need somebody to to take the message forward. What states are currently um, dealing with the most significant infections and then what states are most at risk? And then, yeah, obviously I don't expect you to remember every state off the top of your head, but, but generally where are we looking at? And then I'm also curious about states like, uh, like mine, um, cause I want to talk about best practices and wondering if places like Maine, where we have no cases of it, should we begin initiating those best practices now? But backing up to the beginning of the question, where, where are we seeing the most of it? And, uh, and then who's sort of most at risk? All right. So <laughs> I don't want to point fingers at any particular states, but um, hmm. so I think the states that have found it recently are sort of the ones that are scrambling the most. Like Tennessee just discovered CWD in 2018, and they had a way bigger infection rate than they thought that they might. You know that it was. It wasn't just their first case. They they came out of the gate with like a dozen cases. And then when they went in and looked harder in that area, had way more than they had expected. So I think they've stood up um, a pretty good system relatively quickly. Uh, other states that have found it more recently are in the, are, are in the Southeast. So like Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri, states that have been dealing with it for a while, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Minnesota's done a really good job, I think, with their management. They have had a couple cases of sort of individual detections where they've been able to go in and do some management around that and then haven't subsequently found any cases, which is what happened in New York. And unfortunately, I was not here, so I can't take any credit for it. But (laughs) in 2005, um, New York had two cases in captive herds. And uh, it just happened that it was the perfect storm in the index herd, the first herd that found it. The person owned captive deer. He transported them. He was also a wildlife rehabilitator and a taxidermist. So there's no way to figure out where CWD came from in that scenario. But <laughs> Too many uh, variables. Yeah, just all of them <laughs> are mixed yeah, right, right in. So... There were two deer discovered um, sort of in the disease containment area from that. And they, the New York Department of Environmental Conservation went in and did really intensive management in that area. They put in place regulations like no carcass movement, no rehabilitation, and haven't detected disease in that area since. So New York's one of the few states that actually can you know, be a success story in this. Illinois has done a lot of management and has been able to maintain really low prevalence rates. So it's that sort of consistent, you know, very fast initial, you know, reaction to it to lower the population density and then continued management of that area can can be the most effective, it seems like, from the few examples that we do have. Colorado thinks that they've been able to manage the prevalence rates by uh, their harvest system that they have. So that's been good news. They just put out a paper on that. Um, but for states like Maine, you know, states that haven't detected it yet, I think you you hit it right on the nose where all the preventative measures that you can do now to not get the disease are in your best interest. So things like putting in place carcass importation regulations where hunters going to other states can't bring back the whole intact carcass. They have to bring it back deboned. Um, so they're leaving those high risk parts that we discussed earlier, you know, wherever they shot that deer. You know, uh, it's other things. It's hard for me to picture a couple things when you're saying that it's like, cause we, I'm seeing that now in the law book, but it's not like you come to the border and there's somebody, there's like a checkpoint, right? Mm-hmm. And you could see so many people who just never even really pay attention to that stuff. Or I'm getting the impression that there's a lot of hunters who are kind of like, oh, this is some kind of liberal conspiracy <laughs> to get rid of hunting <laughs> or something, you know? So right. th- th- I could see people just not wanting to 
to comply. Uh, I mm-hmm. could also see how easy it is to be like, well, I'm bringing the head back and the brain is in it and I'm going to blast that out with a pressure washer on my lawn. Um, yep. You know, those kind of things. So it seems like one individual could bring back an infected deer and create a hotspot that could last for the conceivable future, right? That's that's not hard to imagine. So it seems like we there you need to have the regulation, but then there needs to be a strong ethos socially enforced by hunters themselves, right? I mean, regulation is probably not going to be enough to to stop this thing. That that's what I'm hoping, you know, and that's why I keep talking about it. That's why I've started talking to more hunting organizations to try to get that that um, sort of, I guess. It, like you said, ethos or conservation ethic. You know, hunters pride themselves on being the original conservationists. And here's a problem that, you know, hunters likely contributed to, but by taking action and, and it's like, it's inconvenient. There's no way around it. You know, throwing the deer in the back of the pickup and just driving home from wherever is much easier than, you know, chopping it up wherever you happen to be. Or finding it, you know, if you shoot the buck of a lifetime, taking it to a taxidermist and getting it caped out so that you can have it mounted, you know, that's that's not convenient. But this disease is way more inconvenient. And I think that's the the trade-off by realizing that this disease is going to have far-ranging impacts, you know, long after we're gone. When I first started talking about CWD, I I try to connect with people by telling them, you know, like, think about your grandkids hunting and the disease has moved so fast that I talk about, you know, my son now who's eight years old and thinking about his hunting experiences, that it's the disease is going to impact him no matter what state he's living in. We're, we're, we've got to, you know, it's in 26 states now, so we've got to draw the line somewhere. What is, what are the, what is the best and worst case outcomes that you see, you know, if you were going to sort of project, I know asking scientists to speculate these kind of things is always like a challenge, but if you were going to say sort of like best case, here's what we could do. Um, if you didn't have the social fight, the political fight, the monetary fight, you know, the, the state by state by state regulation stuff. But if, if we could just have a best case outcome and then worst case outcome, could this end deer hunting elk hunting as we know it in the United States and Canada. We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, imagine you had a hidden chamber in your home that you could enter to relax, cleanse, detoxify, rejuvenate, tune your metabolism, increase your immune strength, and revitalize your mind. I do. It's called my Clear Light Infrared Sauna. I've been using a Clear Light Sauna for over a decade, and they really are one of my personal secrets to a healthy, happy body and mind. We're in a time of historic stress. Remember that stress activates our fight or flight response, and that's the sympathetic nervous system responding. It's a very important survival mechanism, but the problem is most of us aren't fighting or running from predators, so it's not really helping us deal with the chronic stress of our modern lives. But saunas activate our parasympathetic nervous system. That's the part of us that's activated in deep relaxation or meditation. It's the real antidote to most chronic modern stress. You deserve to feel healthy and relaxed. Go over to HealWithHeat.com and take a look at the line of saunas from Clearlight. They're beautifully made, come in a variety of sizes, and are simple to set up in your home. You can always use the coupon code WILDFED for $500 off any regularly priced sauna. And if a sauna's already on sale, you'll still get $100 off with the coupon code WILDFED. Again, it's HealWithHeat.com and the coupon code is WILDFED. Now, back to the show. All right, well, let's... Let's start with the best possible. So I think if everybody, you know, jumped on board and said, yes, it's a problem now, and there was sufficient funding, that we could probably hold the line, you know, that where CWD exists, it's, we say that it's in 26 states, but it's not in every single county in every single state. It's usually in relatively small pockets. And hunting, is a really important component of that. So we need hunters to keep hunting, to keep the densities low, because that helps stop their transmission. So it's really important to to not let densities get too high. And 
you know, hunters might complain that they're not seeing things. And, and I get that it's, it's not that much fun to sit in a tree stand all day and not see anything, but it's much worse to see a deer staggering around drooling as it dies at your feet of your tree stand, which is how Mississippi detected their very first case. Oh, wow. So I think, you know, everybody sort of, if, if we can get the state agencies more coordinated, so regulations are the same across states, so it's easier for hunters to understand what they do, um, to, to know, okay, if I'm going somewhere else to hunt, I have to check the the regs, all right, they're the same as my state. So I have to debone it. I have to cape it. I have to do these things before I bring it back. I'm going to get in touch with a meat processor or taxidermist where I'm hunting so that I know that if I get something and I don't want to do it myself, I can take it to them. Uh, that would really be something I think that we could keep the prevalence rates really low and just sort of, you know, hold it at bay. The worst case scenario you know, I, I never want to be sort of the chicken little, the sky is falling, but given COVID right now and how just unbelievable, uh, the situation has become, I, I realized maybe I wasn't, you know, coloring outside of the lines of what is possible with CWD. Mm. So at a local level, I think if you have CWD in an area and hunters stop hunting, the population density would increase at first, which would then drive more transmission. So you'd have a lot of sick deer. And I think there would be sick, skinny, drooling deer tipping over on people's lawns, which is what they're seeing in the really hot spots in Wisconsin, where you know a landowner can look out and see a deer and be like, yep, that one probably has CWD. They get permission, they shoot it, it gets tested and, you know, the prevalence rates in certain age classes, like in the adult box is over 50%. So, wow. Yeah. Those are the things we don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but even, even going further than sort of that, that localized level, if CWD with the plant issue that we talked about before, if it really, if, if people perceive that they can get CWD from eating venison or plants, I think that the attitude towards wildlife, so not just deer, towards wildlife as a disease vector, will really make people see them as pests rather than, you know, something uh, yeah. to be valued. Right. And people will be calling for them, to, for deer to be eliminated because they're afraid of getting disease, whether that's true or not. Um there's well, it is scary too, that idea, crops. like if it, yeah. if you had one of those deer, you know, drooling deer die on your lawn and you're like, my kids play on this lawn. Mm -hmm. If they're not, if you're, if you're suggesting, because the current recommendations from the CDC are to not consume venison from C CWD positive animals, I think. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if that's the case, then you're, and you knew that these, pr these prions were, were so, um, perva or, or, uh, hardy in your environment if you knew that they could be on your lawn uh, where your kids play, that seems like just as bad as eating the venison in some ways. Yeah. I think that a lot of people would be very concerned about that. And some of the, the risk perception work I've gotten involved in, it doesn't really matter if it's a true risk or not. So yeah, <laughs> right, right. that a person worried about their kids playing on their lawn, that that's just as real as whether they're actually going to get CWD that way or not. Right. But to go even, you know, one more sort of catastrophic level, if countries are worried about getting crops from areas that have CWD and don't allow import of those products anymore. I mean, wow. think about all the exports that the U.S. has for, you know, wheat and soybeans and all those things in a, a lot of those Midwestern states that are infected, uh, that could be a huge economic blow. And we did start to see a little bit of um, that type of thinking with Norway, where they didn't want any hay imported from uh, areas that might have CWD. So, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, living in unbelievable times. So if you, if you let your imagination go, that it could have really far reaching ramifications, not just for hunters, but, you know, for, for our whole society.
Well, I'm glad that you were uh, kind of willing to just share some of those because those are things I hadn't really considered before. And um, I want to talk about um, what to do if you harvest a deer in a place known to have CWD. What What's in place now for testing? Um, what should people do with the carcass once it's on the ground um, from gutting to, you know, to butchering to disposing of parts. And then in particular, the people listening to the show are the type of people, a lot of them are the type of people who it's like, they're not just going to bring a deer to the game butcher. They're going to, a lot of them are going to do it themselves. A lot of them are going to be like, I'm going to keep these bones to make bone stock. Uh, I'm going to use these brains to brain tan a hide. Um, you know what I mean? Like th- these are mm-hmm. people who want to use these animals really fully in a way that I think is not as common in a lot of um, the, our sort of legacy hunting in the U.S., especially uh, spore hunting. So um, what are those best practices? And also what's in place for people in these states to um, find sure. out if their deer is infected? Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. We process all of our deer at home, too. So. Um, all right. So let's start at the beginning. You you go to an area that's known to have CWD and you're hunting in it, Um, there is usually going to be a system in place, and this is something you should check before you go to that area, uh, to get that animal tested, whether the state is doing it um, through drop boxes, that's a a lot of it, um, or they might have a system in place where you can submit that deer's head to be tested for CWD. And if you do shoot, you know, the the buck of a lifetime and you want to get it mounted, a lot of states have cooperating taxidermists now that actually are learning how to sample the lymph nodes, which are the the tissue that's most desirable for white-tailed deer testing. So they can find those lymph nodes, extract them for you and um, help you get those submitted. So you can contact, you know, there, there should be information online from all these different state agencies about how to get your animal tested. A lot of times we're getting questions now about from hunters in areas where CWD hasn't been detected, but they want to get their animal tested. Like in New York, we have a system through the lab that I work at where hunters can pay to get their animals tested. Not every state has that set up yet. So it's worth checking into, you know, before you um, go out for your hunt. After that, you know, if you have the carcass and you're in a CWD area or a CWD positive state, a lot of states now, like New York just passed a blanket ban that if you go to another state to hunt, you can only bring back the the debone meat. So we really don't want the brain. And I understand the sort of... Uh, cultural lore of brain tanning, but I, I'm not a big fan of that. If you can just stay away from the brain, you'd make my life a whole <laughs> lot easier. So quick, quick sidebar yeah. on that. I want to come right back to this yeah. point, but, but, uh, I'll, I'll have people ask me all the time, like, do you eat the brains of this? Do you eat the brains of that? And I always go like, look, I just don't mess with eating brains. I, I just, am not, I, I, I don't see the value in it based on some of the issues. Are there, would you eat the brains of any animal, not just deer, but of any oh, no. animal, knowing what you know? I, yeah, I didn't think so. No, definitely not brain. I'm not a huge organ person. You know, I know people like the liver and the hearts and everything. And we mm-hmm. did, it's just another sidebar. So uh, if you find what looks like maybe little livers inside the liver of your deer or moose, um, those are probably liver flukes. Those are a parasite. Oh. <laughs> but I have gotten those questions before, you know, like, oh, those little like livers little are really livers. delicious. Oh, no. <laughs> no, those are, no. Those are parasites. Oh, yuck. Okay, right. <laughs> um, so I'm, let's, I'm, are you saying in New York, though, you can't bring antlers back? or? Uh, no, no. So this is, if you can bring the the antlers, you can bring the, you uh, know, okay. clean skull antlers with the clean skull cap attached. You can bring right. the tape. Okay. It's really just the whole carcass. You need to break it down into materials that are less infectious. So we're really okay. trying to get rid of like the, the bones, you, you know, if you have elk ivories or something, you can bring those right. back. Okay. It, it's just like throwing the whole thing in the truck and driving is not ideal anymore what about for the taxidermist or the butcher the game butcher when they're cutting animals that are um infected 
would they not then have tools that were contaminated and, and equipment that's contaminated? And then how, is there any, you know, do, do these things adhere to metals like stainless steel and countertops? Oh yeah, and they like love that? Mm -hmm. They really like stainless steel, unfortunately. I know, just pick all the worst things and just assume it's that. Exactly, right? So so then this cross-contamination must be, has anybody really looked at that yet? So it's it's hard because, you know, it's sort of intuitively obvious. And I don't think people have really gone in and swabbed facilities to look at it. But um, Mm -hmm. in New York, we just sent out guidance to processors and taxidermists about best practices and obviously cleaning equipment, you know, between each animal slows them down. It's tedious. It's hard on the equipment, Um, you know, mixing batches of of animals together for sausage is not a great practice because, you know, then you have to contact a lot of people um, if one of those animals happens to be positive. So ideally, if you can keep those things separate, um, that would be the best way to go. And and like you said, you know, I, I do mine at home because then I know it's my animal and that it's, you know, only that only you know, your what animal. we've harvested yeah. off our property. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I know too much about like other bacterial infections. I don't trust people and how they've handled them and, and keeping them cold. And so mm-hmm. that's why we like to do it ourselves. And, you know, there's a lot of businesses out there that do a really great job. And fortunately, the taxidermists that we partnered with and the, the meat processors that provide samples, they've been great. Um, and I think that by partnering with them through this, um, and letting them know ways that they continue to function. They're, they're one of the best allies in education, in, you know, disease prevention, in like, you know, just figuring out whose deer it is if we have a positive detection. Um, it's really important to make sure that those people know that they're, they're an important part of the equation and they're valued. So, so let's say, okay, so let's say I go to Wisconsin, I harvest a deer. Um, and let's leave the, the whole kind of like, taxidermy piece out of it for now and say I'm just there venison hunting I, I get a deer down I butcher it and bring home the boned out meat but I've left a sample how long am I waiting to find out what the res- results of that test are and in the meantime do I just pack all that up in the freezer like I normally would and just sort of segregate it so that if I need to remove it later I can yes that's exactly what you do wow um, man, so it'd be so it hard to empty on... that freezer out <laughs> I know you just have to, and that's the thing. If you do find out your animal's positive, uh, calling the state agency, you know, the state wildlife agency, so they can dispose of that. So you're not just throwing it in the garbage. Uh, right. We've helped oh, my hunters goodness, with that Because you before. can't just dump it out on the land. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to just dump it out there. You're creating a hot spot. So if you went to Wisconsin and you harvested a deer, you dropped off the head in the one of their head collection bins. And they actually have a really innovative dumpster program in some areas of Wisconsin for hunters to put the rest of the carcass in. So they're not just leaving it on the landscape either. Um, You'd be waiting, you know, if it's the the peak of gun season, maybe a week or two, hopefully not longer than that. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay. Okay. You could have it hanging that long if it was cold. Right. Well, yeah, Wisconsin and Maine, you're probably pretty cold. Um, well, not, not this week states, in November, yeah. 70 degrees, but yeah. A lot of states are using a test that's high throughput called ELISA. And um, so they can turn those results around relatively quickly. And they're trying, you know, they're like right now we're running CWE testing and, and trying to get those results back because we understand, you know, the people are waiting on it. Um, so labs are doing the best that they can, but they're usually understaffed and overburdened. You know, it's hard when all the samples come in during hunting season. So like for New York, we try to spread things out over archery, you know, across the state. So some regions start collecting during the archery season, some start collecting during the gun season. So we don't just get all of our samples in one weekend. Okay. And then obviously lures you were bringing up before, um, urine lures. Um, what about things like, uh, yeah, as being, you know, a potential, because you can just go down to Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop and still buy those products, even though there's the potential that they are contaminated or that there there's theoretically could be. So some states have put bans in place on those products where you can't sell any 
uh, product that might have prions in it. The urine industry has self-implemented a testing procedure for a lot of them. Like, so the bigger companies Mm -hmm. are getting uh, their products batch tested. And so you might see a sticker on the product saying that it, it was tested, but it's, it's really one of those things that I think a lot of hunters weren't necessarily aware of. And depending on, you know, where they get their products from, there's, there's variable risk there. And, even if there's no prions in that product, it's an attractive, really. I mean, you're putting it there, if you're you know, pouring it on the ground to attract deer to a particular area. So just in that way, artificially congregating animals together isn't good from a disease transmission perspective. Where they're all gonna anyway. put their wet noses in the same place is kind of what you exactly. mean. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that must then, then of course, deer feeders just must be, I mean, this is such a common practice to have deer feeders out, um, you know, at least parts of the year. So anything like that, then that congregates deer could become a potential problem. Exactly. Yeah. I actually, um, spoke before the main legislature on this topic, uh, related to deer feeding. And I like to use the analogy of a salad bar, like, you know, back in the day, (laughs) go to restaurants, you know, would you, we've got sneeze guards, we've got tongs, you know, dedicated for each thing. Like imagine if you just went up and there was like a big trough and you and all your friends just had to stick your faces in that and start eating. Like nobody would do that because it's gross, you know? Right. Is, is right now with, has, has COVID and the awareness of biosecurity made this an easier conversation for you to have, or has it drown out the signal on CWD? I guess I don't know the answer to that yet because I've been stuck in my house mostly. I haven't been able to (laughs) talk to as many people as I normally would. But I did write an article about how many similarities there are between COVID and CWD just in our learning. You know, how many people would have understood sort of, um, you know, transmission dynamics and you know now we talk about the physical distancing to keep keep yourself safe or wearing a mask to try to to stop that transmission you know we in the early part of the pandemic we were hearing about r not values like nobody had heard of r not mm-hmm. before that except for you know us dorky epidemiology types so i think it really has made people sort of aware of disease issues in a, a grander scale. And so if you can use some of the, the language that we're using for COVID now to, to help understand CWD, because that's part of the problem, just like we've been having this conversation for an hour and you know, you've had to stay, stop and say, wait, what? How many times? Yeah, because yeah. so many of these things are just kind of crazy. And mm-hmm. I also get the sense we've only really scratched the surface in this last hour on this topic. Oh yeah. There's, there's a lot that you can dig into and it's not intuitive. You know, all these mm-hmm. things that we have learned um, about biology don't necessarily apply to prion. So we have to learn new things and, and sort of be open to how they can function. Are there any other things that you want? I, I do have one other topic I want to just, uh, if, if I can get a few more minutes of your time, I wanted to ask you about, and and that's lead ammunition. But before we go there, is there anything else best practice-wise or just um, about the disease itself that you want to make sure we leave listeners with that didn't get brought up? Well, I think the most important thing, and, and hopefully people have picked up on this already, is that it, it really happens at an individual level, that we need hunters to take responsibility for their actions to help not move disease around. I think state agencies are overwhelmed in a lot of cases, and and there is a small but vocal minority who think that CWD is not a problem or it's overblown, but the ramifications of this disease can be huge. And maybe you won't see it in the next decade, but over the last two decades, the the rate of increase in the number of states that are affected and the amount of money states are putting towards it, like even if you just care about butterflies, CWD is going to impact you and what you care about in wildlife. So I think 
that's where we need people to be supportive of state agencies and understand that they have a role that they can play in it. You know, before we were talking about the sort of um, social pressure from hunters uh, to other hunters and how I think that that can be so much more important than regulation at certain times. And uh, I recently got to sit down with Judy Camuso, who's the commissioner here of Inland Fish and Wildlife for Maine. And she's been a big part of promoting non lead ammunition uh, in the state. And I was asking her recently because there's been so many emails that have been coming out from the state of Maine about it. I was like, is there going to be regulation about this? And she was saying, well, no, that's the goal is really you know, to use education and to get hunters on board with this without having to use regulation. And I know you have uh, some expertise on this topic as well. And so I was hoping to just get a little bit of an overview from you on that as well. What What's going on in this conversation about uh, lead versus non-toxic ammunition? Um, what do we know about some of the impacts uh, of lead ammunition on wildlife and on the humans who consume wildlife shot with lead? Um, and, uh, and what are we seeing sort of at a, I guess, in the industry, uh, that might be a positive sort of shift, uh, towards non-toxic, uh, shooting? Sure. Um, so I can, starting on like the scientific impact of lead, we just recently wrapped up a large study looking at bald eagle populations, across the Northeast. So Maine was included in that. We had bald eagle numbers from Avian Haven in a rehabilitation facility there. And what we did was we got count data. So from the recovery of bald eagles starting in uh, 1990, just the count data of how many you know bald eagles are out there in a state. And then we were able to look at the necropsy data. So how many bald eagles died how many of those died from lead and how many of those died sort of with lead on board in their system, which may or may not have contributed to their death. And what we found was in the Northeast that lead slowed the population recovery down by between four and 6%. So it didn't stop it. Bald eagles were able to recover, but it definitely had a population level impact. And that's been one of the big questions that state agencies have been asking all along, you know, what is the population level impact? So we know that there was one, it wasn't extreme. Um, bald eagles obviously recovered, but it, it did affect them. And if that lead this wasn't is from there, them feeding on, this is from them feeding on carcasses that have been shot with lead. Yes, most likely. So lead ammunition, you know, there's people always say, Oh, there's, you know, smelters or batteries, but we, we know that the majority of, um, scavengers are are getting it from lead ammunition. So, you know, you have leave your gut pile in the field, there are lead fragments in that. And so those fragments, especially because they're small, um, they get into, you know, a bird or whatever stomach and the acid in their stomach dissolves that lead and then it goes into their system and causes a whole host of, of problems. So right now, the CDC says the optimal level of lead in humans is zero. Yeah, so I was going to say none. <laughs> yeah, we know it's a toxin. We've known that for you know centuries. So that study is um, in review right now. But we realized, you know, there, there's been so much about regulation of lead, and it's, it gets so controversial when you start talking about regulation. So... I'd, I'm with Judy that I would rather have hunters make the decisions them, themselves. And unfortunately, there's a lot of sort of historical, um, I don't know, uh, wives tales about lead and how it functions and it'll foul the barrel and all this. And, and that's just really not the case. So, you know, I would encourage hunters to, to go out and try it for themselves. Right now, one of the biggest issues seems to be access to non-lead ammunition, that it's it's not always well. Right now, it's boxes. access to any any ammunition. Yeah, well, right now, you know, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> if you didn't stockpile early in the pandemic, you know, um, you know, it's it and that I think can be something that hunters can drive the conversation on with retailers. You know, say, hey, I'm, yeah. I want this stuff in your store. Can you get it? Um, 
we've been working with the North American Non-Lead Partnership to try to figure out the best way to communicate with hunters about this issue. You know, um, we were, before the pandemic happened, we were going to have a, a workshop. We had the ballistic gels uh, ready to go to, to let hunters, you know, see the difference between how a lead bullet fragments and how far it actually goes from the wound channel. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. You know, if you want to get the most meat off of that deer that you possibly can, you know, you're going to trim and like, okay, this looks good. This doesn't look so good. I'm going to pitch it. Those fragments are so small that you can't tell. So it can travel up to uh, 13 centimeters away from the wound channel or more. So when you see x-rays and see how far that uh, lead disperses through the wound channel, it, it's really dramatic. Um, how are they testing that? Are they needing to use like radioisotopes of lead or something, or are they able to just detect that through regular x-ray? So you can see the lead on x-ray. It shows up, okay. you know, okay. clear as yeah. day. And and the radio, the isotopes are something that I actually tried to look into more but because so much, like when we talk about ammunition versus other sources of lead to see where they came from, but so much of the lead that we use is recycled that you can't tell necessarily the, the isotope signature mm-hmm. from bullet versus, you know, a tire weight or something like that, because it's okay. probably been through several lifetimes already. Are those tire weights are lead? Mm-hmm. Oh, dear God, they fall off all the time. Yeah. My- my goodness what are we doing (laughs) what are we doing oh wow so you're saying though like when you find um lead in animals you it's hard to determine the origin is that what you meant right so okay you know if we get a dead animal on the table or you know a live animal comes into rehab they test the blood and might find lead in it or you know we'll test the liver and we'll see elevated levels of lead that way um but Usually the lead itself is long gone. Things like lead sinkers in loons, it's a mm-hmm. lot more obvious because that's like a big chunk of lead that they still may have in right. their stomach. In their crop, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I would think you were saying before about, um, I, I forget how you phrased it, but sort of looking at um, people's response to this issue. Because um, it seems to me the two most important things, at least what what changed me personally one was influencers so i had a couple of key people one good friend of mine arthur haynes um who was really showing me stuff on toxicity in people who've been eat, elevated lead levels and people who'd consumed venison shot with lead uh that to me i mean the eagle thing is incredibly compelling because i care about eagles but i have to say selfishly if you tell me that i'm feeding my friends and and my wife you know lead fragments that that had a huge impact the other one yeah like i said uh you know so human stuff and then the influencer thing seeing people like um steve ranella from meat eater really pushing for you know copper monolithics and non-toxic uh shot and things like that those two things had a huge impact what are you guys for me personally but what are you finding influences people the most on this well we have a a study going on so all of those things i think are important and trying to figure out um, what what people respond to the most, you know, whether it's it's shots of soaring bald eagles or sick bald eagles, or um, you know, talking about feeding it to your family and the the impact on your children, mm-hmm. or you know, a trustworthy source communicating it to you, because a lot of people get you know, kind of their dander up a, about it, and sometimes it's hard to have a a conversation. So having those trusted sources is really important. Um, So that's actually the study that we're doing right now. So I can come back later and share the results with you. But we're talking to a a lot of um, hunter ed instructors, you know, because they see so many new hunters. And, you know, they've been, they've usually been hunting for a long time. So try to get their impressions on what some of the issues are, what's meaningful for people. So yeah, it's um, it's more social science research yeah, um, right, that I've right. done before, and I'm I'm very fortunate to partner with other Cornell professionals that have more expertise in that area, um, and a great videographer, David Brown, who's been you know just getting some incredible footage. He um, 
I just had to buy some more ballistic gels for him. He's got a super high speed camera from the Cornell physics department that he's going to be recording. Uh, I can't wait to you know, see how these gels go. I mean, I've been watching a lot of uh, footage that is available and just seeing the, the shock wave that goes through those, you know, when the bullet hits is really just crazy. So can I just um, say for the listener that we're we're talking about ballistic gelatin, which is uh, which is used because of its similar density to to tissue, so that when you fire ammunition into it, you can get a sense of the wound channel that that causes, and also what, how that bullet fragments or doesn't fragment, or, or what kind of uh, sh- secondary channels, primary channels you get, and things like that. So, um, just want to make sure people know what you're talking about, uh, because I'm I gotta say. Uh, I, it feels like too. You're also up against things like, um, man. I've got a neighbor who's just like, oh, Daniel. I, you know, I, when I was a kid, we used to just pour molten lead in the garage. You know, sitting there breathing mm-hmm. the vapors, and I'm fine. And it's like, well, <laughs> kind of fine. Uh, but also, I think like the idea, like you had me at reduced IQ. It's like IQ mm-hmm. ha- is one of the most significant factors in your in your success outcome right? It's like, this is a really, really big deal. You know, it's just to me, the idea that we would be using something that could reduce our children's IQ and immune systems like the way that it can. It's terrifying to me, that idea. Uh, So it seems like it's so simple. But then I think when you have um, particular, I think it'll be a lot easier of a sell on the new generation of hunters, but on the older generation, boy, it's going to be hard to get people to, to switch. (laughs) I can imagine anyway. I know. And it, well, that's the thing. There's, there's so many um, sort of myths and misinformation out there, not, not only on lead, but chronic wasting disease. And so trying to, mm-hmm. to counteract that is really challenging because people hear a message and they sort of latch onto that. I mean, the fact that um, I hadn't heard before, but Gordon Batchelor, who used to be the chief uh, wildlife biologist for New York DEC, he was talking about how for big game hunting in Africa, they only would use monolithic bullets. That's what they oh, would yeah. use to knock oh, yeah. down the biggest for penetration. Game. Yeah. yeah, and and so the you know people saying that they're that these aren't as effective as lead just didn't sit right with me. And and I've shot multiple deer now. My husband got all happy because I I said we're getting a new rifle. We're only shooting lead. He's like, okay, we're, you know, I'm on board. So I've I've seen it. You know, I've, <laughs> you mean you're I've only shooting non lead out of the new rifle? Yeah, sorry, my bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, non lead out of the new rifle. I dropped two deer last fall with it. You know, and, and what it round? What bullet are you safe. using? Curiously, uh, it's a Barnes Triple uh, X. TSX. Man, yeah. that bullet is. Kristen, that bullet's blowing my mind. I'm using Federal's loading of that, the uh, Federal Premium Barnes TSX. I shoot 308, so in the 165 grain, and and I have shot three bucks uh, this year with it, and uh, one buck ran about 20 yards. Two bucks immediately went to the ground, um, and I shot a bear over 400 pounds. Um, oh wow! And what's fascinating to me is I that bullet because it's monolithic. I, always is through and through. So um, I did recover one of those bullets because it went through a deer and ended up lodged in its back knee. Um, so I was able to recover it and actually see what that bullet looked like after. And it's kind of nice to be able to handle that bullet because, you know, I've kept that. And uh, because I know it's not lead, it doesn't skeeve me out to like handle it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, you know, as far as if I did have to track these animals and then, you know, my bear probably ran 25 yards, um, there's such a blood trail cause you've got that exit wound, uh, which is really nice. You get that deep penetration, but, uh, I have been incredibly impressed with the consistency and, and actually on that topic of, um, sort of peer recommendation, uh, I guess not really my peer, but I, I had first heard about that particular bullet. My friend Arthur had been prompting me to look at copper bullets but it was he i didn't know which one and then this particular bullet we've been talking about uh, i was just reading a sort of novel a, a, a former navy seal guy's novel and he was talking about how uh they had started loading that bullet um for their sniper weapons because they had been using it big game hunting and seen how effective it was and so they switched it over um 
And I was like, well, that's that's a compelling argument. <laughs> so I tested that Absolutely. bullet out anyway. I, I've had uh, just incredible results. And the feeling of having a bullet that I know is non-toxic is, I don't know, I feel so much better about it. Also, I want to say that the uh, damage to the meat, because that bullet retains 100% of, or almost 100% of its mass, there... I'm not losing as much meat. You don't have all that mm -hmm. bruised bloodshot meat with all these little side wound channels from, from that bullet breaking apart. And so I'm getting far more meat uh, yield as well. And then I don't have that fear that, 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 cause I always, always picture too, like the lead is as it's moving through and it's contacting fats and then it's like leaching deposits off as it passes through. So maybe there's no, you know what I mean? Like the way if I took mm -hmm. lead on a piece of paper and I dragged it across the paper, it would leave lead behind, you know, residue. Right. So anyway, knowing none of that's there has increased my confidence um, in eating that meat and sharing that meat with people. But ballistically, I mean, it's been more consistent than anything I've shot. So I'm having great results. Right. I, I completely agree. And I think that... Um, the programs that have been most successful, like in Arizona, they've been trading, you know, non-lead ammunition to hunters. So like, go shoot it, try it. And oh, cool. that, that's been really uh, an effective way. So, you know, the cost comes up as an issue, but really, if you compare premium lead to, to non-lead, the cost is, is pretty negligible. So, um, it's just, you know, hunters deciding what they want to stand for and, and what they're comfortable with, just like your story, you know, that it's meaningful to, to be able to, you know, know that you had a, a good shot, that it was a clean kill, and that you feel comfortable, you know, sharing that animal with others, too. I'm now I'm on so all my big game hunting with this TSX I'm using heavy shot uh, for turkeys, obviously, all of uh, water fouling is with non-lead anyway. Um, the issue I'm having is with small game with 22 caliber stuff. So my, all my mm -hmm. 22 long rifle stuff is still, you know, it's, it's not even jacketed, right? I think it's a uh, copper plated lead. Um, and I have a lot of it, but the options out there aren't that good yet. So we need to start seeing some high quality 20 accurate 22 ammunition because I shoot a lot of squirrels and, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's one of my favorite foods really. And, uh, but unfortunately I don't have a non-lead alternative yet. I've seen some, um, polymer alloys and, um, uh, some nickel stuff, but they, they, they're loud and they are inaccurate as the reports I hear all the time. And, uh, so I'm, that's the one, I don't know if you've seen anything in that category, but that's the one area that I'm, I'm looking at. You know, I've heard, I've heard that concern before too. And, and so I think that's something that, um, we really do need to, to look into more. So yeah, it, and this is a problem we really need to wrap our arms around from the hunters all the way to the manufacturers, to the retailers. So it's not, you know, that you can find the stuff that you need, that they know that there's a market for it because, right. um, we have a, a video on our website that, uh, Gordon Batchelor did that talks about how the manufacturing of these bullets has to completely change. They need completely different equipment. So it's a big investment for these manufacturers to, to go to um, non-lead alternatives. But if they know that there's going to be a market for it, I think they're probably willing to do it. Um, you've been so generous with your time today. I just want to ask you sort of one more thing and that's, um, you know, when you're talking about the non-lead ammunition, it's like we're talking about the future of hunting, really. And then when we're talking about CWD, that it, it puts this this sort of ominous shadow over the future of hunting, right? It's like I can see, like I can see this path to like a beautiful shift in hunting to this like non-toxic sort of more ecologically sound approach than we've had over the last probably, you know, well, I don't even want to guess how long. And then I can also see things coming to uh, kind of a, just sort of a sad place if we were to no longer be able to hunt cervids the way that we have for so long. So I'm curious, just when you're looking out at the future of the hunting landscape as a hunter, but also uh, as a wildlife ecologist, are, are you feeling kind of a a pessimism about where this is headed? Or are you feeling optimistic or are you going to take like a scientific approach and be like, I cannot <laughs> say one way or the other. <laughs> I'm going to look at the data. Uh, I guess, you know, how, how are you seeing all this play out? 
Uh, I'm going to pick C on that one. <laughs> I just um, thought you might. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, there's there's evidence on, on both sides. I think, you know, I've had really good working relationships with the National Deer Alliance and trying to get the message out about CWD. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to engage with hunters in understanding what's meaningful to them because they're such a big part of the equation. And it's so easy to just turn off and go, eh, that doesn't affect me. You know, I, for you, I live in Maine. Why should I bother with this? It's far away from me. And the problem is we've seen it crop up in so many states without any warning. And so, it, you know, it may not affect you right now, but it could in the future. Or if you want to travel or if you care about other wildlife, it just there's so many ways that that hunters could be involved in this. And so I think it's that, that energy, that activation. And I know people are tired. There's so much stuff going on. Just the, the energy it takes to put yourself in a tree stand on any given day is maybe <laughs> more than people can mm -hmm. bear, but to recognize that it's important and to join with other people that feel like it's important and are carrying the, that message forward because they're, there's a lot of other people yelling very loudly about whatever their pet interest is. And I think in a lot of cases, hunters are getting drowned out and understanding that important, that hunting uh, and hunters are important for CWD in everything we're doing and surveillance and prevention and management, that it's not just something you can kind of turn a blind eye to. So that's why I, I constantly implore the hunters that, you know, it might be a, a small proportion of the the population, but you're mighty when it comes to these things that we really care about. Yeah. Um, we're going to put uh, links to, to you and to your bio and all of that. Are there any websites that people should know about uh, if they want to learn more about CWD? The CWD Alliance. Um, so it's cwd-info.org is a really good one. Um, it's got links to all the states, information, that you can kind of see the timeline on CWD, you can see the current map. Um, that's a really good one. I mentioned the National Deer Alliance, which was just uh, launched what, two days ago. Um, and that's a, a joining of the National Deer Association and Quality Deer Management Association. Um, they've been trying to be vocal and active on Capitol Hill regarding CWD. The Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership has been very active. Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies are all all good ones that um, are trying to to be politically active around CWD. So I think you know, state people can always contact their their state agencies and uh, legislatures to let them know they care about it. That goes a really long way as well. Great. And is there anywhere that uh, you would like people to find uh, you or your work personally on social media or on the web? Um, so I am the co-director of the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab. So you can always just Google Cornell Wildlife Health Lab and look it up. And my Twitter handle, which I actually had to look up, is um, at wildlife DZ eco. Awesome. And so we'll put links to that too. And I just want to say thanks for your time today. Thanks for, uh, you know, tolerating all of these uh, interruptions and questions I have and uh, really just want to say thank you for the work you're doing because I value these um, animals and resources so much and knowing you're out there doing this work I just really really appreciate it personally so thank you so much well I appreciate you getting the word out so uh, feelings mutual thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast you can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review it ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.